We're in the season of what they call Advent. Um, and if you're not familiar with Advent, maybe the only familiarity you have with Advent is the calendar you see in Kmart with the little pouches, you know, and that you put, put little chocolates in. Um, I don't know whether you've got one of those. Uh, we, we, I don't think we've, we haven't got ours up yet, but it will be up today uh, with a lot of other things that'll be up today. And uh, it'll have little chocolates in there. And when the kids were home, um, they would each have a turn on their date. They could pick out whatever was in the pocket for the 24 days leading up to Christmas. Now it's just Deb and I, so we'll empty the pockets ourselves, I, I think, and we'll enjoy those things. No, we won't, but we'll find some way of getting it to the kids. But mate, if that's your only familiarity with Advent, it has a tradition, it has a history which goes back to 480 AD. And uh, as a church... And really, Tess came up with the idea. She said, why don't we, why don't we just uh, spend the four Sundays leading up to Christmas uh, thinking about Advent and, and preaching in accordance with Advent so that this anticipation of Christmas can build up in our campus. And we thought it was a great idea. And uh, Tess came up with even the topics that we should preach on and uh, a little bit of the history. So I'll give you a little bit of the history of Advent uh, before we start and, uh, and then tell you what the next four weeks are going to look like. So it officially begins on the first Sunday of December, traditionally, and it's a season of anticipation. It anticipates the impending arrival of Jesus Christ, his, his first coming at Christmas, obviously, but also his second coming when the Bible tells us Jesus will return to judge all the peoples of the earth, but it also anticipates his daily participation in our lives. That's what Advent is about. It's about Christmas, it's about Jesus' second coming, and if you like, it's about the coming of his kingdom in our own hearts individually. Uh, it's been observed, as I said, since 480 AD, and of course, it, its beginnings were in the Northern Hemisphere. So in the Northern Hemisphere, the seasons were opposite, so the days were becoming shorter. And actually, Christmas Day, uh, back in the day, was celebrated at the winter solstice. The, the shortest day of the year was Christmas Day. That was before they took on the 25th of December. The day of least light, the day of most darkness. And why was that? Because the anticipation of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, shining in a dark place. It just, uh, it just built the anticipation uh, in the people. Historically, many people fasted for that season of Advent until the Christmas feast on Christmas Day. Um, the colours used traditionally were uh, purple or violet to symbolise royalty, of course, Jesus being the Prince of Peace, uh, blue uh, representing hope, and black representing um, the darkness or the anticipation of light. Uh, candles and wreaths were also associated with Advent, the, the wreath being um, the, the symbol of victory that Jesus Christ had over sin and death. Um, its circular shape was the, uh, the, the, um, the movement of the earth around the sun and the increasing cycle of light um, that it has on its way. Uh, the traditional fir tree foliage represents strength and life. The holly, which never loses its leaves, was meant to represent the eternal God. Uh, four candles were to represent, and they were added each week, the four weeks of Advent, increasing the light on the wreath and they were placed on doors or on tables and they were there to welcome visitors into your home. So there's a little bit of history for you on Advent and uh, in our home we traditionally use the first or the closest Sunday to the beginning of December um, to decorate our home. So this afternoon the boys will be up on the roof putting lights up and uh, the girls will be inside putting up the tree and decorating inside. That's the way it goes and after we've done that we'll... F Did I write fast? No, feast. Feast is what we do. <laughs> so we're not quite traditional. And there's too many things happening during December to be fasting, I tell you. But we will fast in February. And we uh, encourage all of you to do the same in the month of February as we as a church fast uh, for what God wants to do in our lives and in us as a church. But during these four Sundays up until Christmas... Um, we're going to be dealing with four separate subjects of the anticipation of Christmas and you're going to be getting a different speaker each Sunday. So today it's me obviously and I'll be preaching on the promise, the promise of Christmas. And uh, next week Pastor Deb will be preaching on the prophecy of the birth of Jesus Christ and then we'll have Renee who'll be speaking on the Sunday after, on the 16th, she'll be speaking on the, um, the humility 
of the birth of Christ. And then on the 23rd test, our Lakes campus will be joining us on that Sunday. On the 23rd test, we'll be preaching on engaging Jesus. And then on Tuesday, Christmas Day, Pastor Jazz is going to be preaching to our SCF United right here at Woodcrest at 9 a.m. on Christmas Day. And she'll be preaching on the gift. So there you've got the whole of December, you've got the preview, but it's going to be a great month and it's all about Christmas, the birth of Christ and getting our heads in that space. But this morning it's about the promise and as soon as I mentioned promise, um, I don't know whether you watch the news or, but um, sadly in our society, sadly now in these days we hear more and more stories of broken promises rather than promises fulfilled, don't we? Regularly, our media replay the promises our politicians made us during their election campaigns. And then the story is, of course, how that promise has been broken. The ABC even went to the extent during the Abbott years of prime ministership of putting in a promise tracker to, to track the number of promises broken by our government. And we smile about it now, but actually it's rather sad. Royal commissions regularly investigate people and organisations who have promised to deliver certain goods and services and haven't delivered on those promises. And our current inquiry into banking and insurance is a, an example of that. Interestingly, just this week, Deb and I received a cheque from AMP for the princely sum of $44.42 for a mistake AMP made back in 2013. And I thought to myself, would we have got that cheque if there wasn't an inquiry going at the moment? Sporting stars, entertainment personalities, big business identities, no one's immune. Story after story of promises broken in their public and private lives. And maybe as you're thinking about this, it's becoming a little more personal than that for you. Parents who have broken promises to you and to one another. Is it any wonder that so much faith and respect has been lost in people and institutions that have historically been held in high regard? What money promised us has not been delivered. What love promised us has not been delivered. What success promised us hasn't been delivered. And in contrast to all this disappointment, each year we come to this season which at its core speaks of promises fulfilled. For although we'll be let down by governments and big business and personalities and perhaps people even closer to us than that, God has never failed to deliver on even one of his promises. He is eternally faithful to all that he has spoken. That's what Christmas reminds us of, the faithfulness of God. He says of himself in Psalm 89, verse 30, 34, No, I will not break my covenant. I will not take back one word of what I have said. And in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says this, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. Amen. Even Jesus wouldn't trust people. Word of God tells us that. Jesus wouldn't entrust himself to any man, but he trusted completely in his heavenly Father. And that's the trust that God is still looking for, trusting him. God rewarded that trust from the very beginning of his people and we see that trust demonstrated and rewarded again at the beginning of the Christmas story. What sort of faith or trust is it we're talking about? Well, let's have a look at the promises of God to two very ordinary people. And when I mention their names, you might not think that they're so ordinary, they're rather extraordinary but before God's promise came to them, they were just ordinary people. Their response to that promise made them extraordinary. In the genealogy of Jesus Christ, as we read it in Matthew 1, they are the first and last names mentioned in 42 generations, like brackets, brackets of faith around the whole family of God. And it seems we're on a bit of a generational theme this morning. I'm going to be mentioning a bit about generations as well. 
the beginning of the family line and the end of it were people of faith in the promises of God. I'm reading first from Genesis chapter 15 and then also from Luke chapter 1. Genesis 15 and Luke chapter 1, if you're using your devices, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It'll also be up on screen for you. Genesis 15, the first six verses, and then Luke 1, verses 26 to 38. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abraham replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant of my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. The purpose of stars is what I was, what I was going to preach on this morning, but I changed tack. But isn't it interesting that the stars are representative of how many the people of God will be, the descendants of Abraham. And of course, we're not just talking about Jews here. We know from the New Testament that those who are descended from Abraham are of the same faith as Abraham. So we're talking about all of those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. Of course, Abraham could only see, they say, about 30,000 stars in his day, even if he did count them. But we know now with our telescopes that there are billions upon billions of stars. So when we look up in the sky... Let it remind you that Christianity is not a dying religion. And if you're after a quiet place in heaven, you introverts. <laughs> yep, sorry. It's going to be pretty full. My house will be full, God said. Amen. And I wonder then whether the star that the wise men followed, this new star that appeared in the sky, when you think about it, the incarnate Jesus Christ, the Jesus who became the first of many. It sort of makes sense that there would be another star when he becomes incarnate as a human being, doesn't it? Anyway, just a thought. I'm not going that way. So the last verse in Genesis 15, verse 6 there, And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And now we're going to Luke 1. 26 to 38, this will be a familiar passage for you. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favoured woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Abraham, the first name mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, and Mary before Jesus himself, the last name mentioned. Well, what do we know about Abraham that caused him to be chosen by God to be the receiver of such great blessing 
and become the father of many nations. Well, we first hear of him in Genesis 11 uh, when the family tree of Shem is being unpacked. And Shem, of course, was Noah's eldest son. And uh, Abram was Shem's great, 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 great grandson. There were nine generations that separated Noah, or Shem rather, from Abram. Terah, Abram's father, decided to leave Ur, the place that they were living, and head for Canaan. And he took along Abram and his wife Sarai and his grandson Lot. But they stopped in Haran along the way and they settled there. The next thing we know is that God is speaking to Abraham, telling him to move on to the land God will show him and promising to make him into a great nation, make him famous and be the receiver and the source of great blessing. Abraham's only claim to fame is that he's in the family tree of Noah and yet God singles him out for greatness. Now, why is that? Why him? Now fast forward some 2,000 years to a young woman named Mary living in a backwater town of Nazareth up north there in Galilee and Mary is visited by the angel Gabriel with a message that God, from God that she is favoured and will become the mother of the Son of God. What, well, what do we know about Mary of Nazareth prior to the visitation? Why is she so favoured? We know that she was a virgin engaged to be married to someone in the family line of David. The truth is that there's actually nothing in the recorded history of either Abram or Mary that gives us a clue as to why God favoured them so much. And many people have surmised about the exemplary lives that each of them must have had, that they must have, their their faithfulness and their piety and and their, their, uh, their, their service to God, they gave them credentials for such special treatment from God. But people are just, that's just conjecture. The Bible doesn't mention a word of such godliness before God approached them. They were just ordinary people. We don't know the history of Abram and Mary, but we do know the nature of God. We do know that. That he is a God who shows unmerited favour to people. His grace goes out to all the world, the Bible tells us. The truth is that the most undeserving person can be approached with the favour of God. And God's not looking for something in us to qualify us for that grace. He simply makes a promise to us and he expects us to believe him on the basis that he is always faithful to every word that he has ever spoken. When we don't trust him, we actually make God out to be a liar. But when you put your trust in what God has said, you get everything you will ever need. You know what the two key verses from these two scriptures were? You probably guessed already, but here they are. Genesis 15, 6, And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And then Luke 1, 38, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Abram and Mary had one thing in common. They both took God at his word, no matter how impossible it seemed to them. They both believed the promise of God and as a result got everything they needed, righteousness and a saviour. It's everything we'll ever need. The saviour Jesus Christ and his righteousness given to us. No matter what their physical limitations to the promise of God, Abram too old, Mary still a virgin, an unmarried one at that, they refused to let what they considered too hard for them to be too hard for the word of God. No matter how beyond their understanding the promise of God was, they refused to be limited by their own intellectual capacity and instead rather trusted in the superior wisdom of God. Their physical No matter how bad they were physically, they refused to allow that to dictate what God wanted to do. No matter how, uh, how, um, um, what's the word? I don't have the word. How unlikely intellectually, thank you. How unlikely intellectually the promise of God seemed to them. They refused to let that dictate what God wanted to do. 
Abraham was despondent about not having an heir when God came to him. Mary was afraid, confused and disturbed, we're told, when God's word came to her through the angel. But neither of them let their emotions control them when it came to believing the word of God. They trusted God despite their emotions. They trusted God despite their intellect and they trusted God despite their physical inability. Remember that what we know about Abram and Mary and how notable they became all happened after they believed the word of God. Before that, they were just ordinary people with no notable history. But we do know this. They refused to allow their physical, intellectual and emotional shortcomings to determine what they believed when it came to the word of God. Rather than let their physical, intellectual and emotional realities take charge they chose to respond in faith. You see, faith is the only response that works when it comes to the faithfulness of God. The God who always fulfills his word and never breaks a promise is wanting our faith, not our physical ability, not our intellectual understanding, not our emotional stability. He just wants our faith. He wants our trust in him. He simply wants us to take him at his word. That's what English evangelist Leonard Ravenhill said the definition of faith was, taking God at his word. And as much as Christmas is a time when we remember God's greatest gift to each person who was or ever will live, the gift of Jesus Christ, who, t- who died for our sins and set us free from that slavery, so that we could be reconciled to a loving relationship with God as our Father, we also should allow this season to remind us that God is a promise keeper and God is a faith seeker. He's a promise keeper and he's a faith seeker. God is looking for faith. And if we use Advent to anticipate Jesus' second coming, let's be reminded of these words that Jesus said about that time. He said this in Luke 18, 8, but when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? And as we contemplate how important faith is in this season, we would do well to remember that the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 11, verse 6, and it is impossible to please God without faith. So can I ask you this question? Are you an ordinary person? or an extraordinary person? And I'm not talking about your social media persona right now. I'm talking about who you really think you are. An ordinary person or an extraordinary person? Are you physically able to carry out God-sized tasks? (laughs) Do you have the intellectual capacity for understanding God's possibilities? Are you in control emotionally all the time? The writer to the Hebrews didn't say that the people of the Bible had a good reputation. He said this in chapter 11, verse 2, through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. We're just ordinary people. But as we place our faith in the unbroken promises of God, As we put our trust in the God who always keeps his word, we earn a good reputation. Abram and Mary didn't have a reputation that we know about that made them candidates for the promises of God. It was their faith that earned them a good reputation. So I can safely say to all the ordinary people here this morning, I hope I'm in good company, that faith is waiting to earn you an extraordinary reputation. God's word is full of his great and precious promises to us. If you're not regularly feeding your spirit on God's word, how will you ever know what his word says to you or what his promises are for you? Can I encourage you as you're thinking about a new year? Maybe there's a resolution that you need to make. You know, I need to be in God's word more than any other next year. I need to be in it more regularly. 
I need to be searching out the promises of God. I think it's just wonderful that uh, term one of next year, our theme as a church will be unshakable hope. And it's all about the promises of God and how characters in the Bible took hold of them and how we can also take hold of them. So I encourage you, next term, I'll say it even now, be in church every Sunday to hear the promises of God, believing them, activating your faith towards them, earning a good reputation. Can I ask the musicians to return? At Christmas, we remember and celebrate the promise of God fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That God was providing a way for us to be be forgiven and to be set free. And he would do it by sending his own son into the world to save people from their sins. To receive this free gift of Jesus Christ, the only thing required is faith. Not your physical ability, not your intellectual understanding, not your emotional stability. Jesus comes to you the way you are, right now, as you are. And he's not looking for what qualifies you. He's saying, I have qualified you. All I need from you is to believe. All I need from you is to put your faith, your trust in me. Not what you can do. And not what you have done. Put your faith in me. There's a word used, and it's mostly used in a theological sense. It's the word imputed. It means to be credited with. To be credited with. Abraham, the Bible says, was credited with righteousness. That means a right standing with God. He was given that because of his faith. It was imputed to him. Jesus also had something imputed to him. He had our sin, our failure imputed to him. He was credited with everything we'd done wrong. And he took it to the cross. And he paid the penalty for it. So that every single person who has ever lived or will ever live, who puts their trust in him, who believes his promise that they have been forgiven and can have new life so that they can be credited with his righteousness. An exchange takes place when we put our trust in Jesus Christ. He has taken our sin and exchanged it for his righteousness. It's a wonderful deal. It's an incredible deal. And it's yours to have today.